I want to talk first about the Green Interview a little bit. We started in 2010, and we're now up to about 100 interviews, uh, 100 videos. About 90% of the interviews, <coughs> are, or the videos are interviews, and this is the team that does it. It's uh, Chris Beckett, formerly the head of uh, instructional television at Mount St. Vincent, and myself. And I'm always surprised that this slide doesn't immediately get a laugh, because that's what we used to call ourselves, the Ophias Group, Old Farts, and the Subaru. So I've been a newspaper columnist, and I had been writing about environmental matters a lot, and I realized there were a lot of, of uh, really impressive people around the world doing all kinds of really interesting and important things. And I thought, wouldn't it be lovely to uh, be able to give a bit of a voice to people like that and to bring them together in one place? And that was kind of the inspiration behind doing the Green Interview. Uh, so as I say, we're up to about 100 now, and uh, just step through a couple of them. We're going to go fairly quickly here. So Vandana Shiva, one of the original tree huggers, uh, phenomenal uh, activist on behalf of the Earth from India. Um, next, David Suzuki, who probably needs no introduction, the leading environmentalist in the country and uh, the most trusted Canadian of our time. Next, the Paul Watson, who's given his life to the defense of the whales with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, a really uncompromising environmentalist and a very, very courageous man. Uh, next. Elizabeth May, who when I met her was, uh, came from Marguerite Harbor and was fighting against the, uh, the poisoning of the forest here. And uh, I've laughed ever since that uh, she and I have been, have been friends since she was 18. And of course, she's now emerged as a major figure in Canada and abroad. Uh, next, George Monbiot, the wonderful writer for The Guardian and also a very courageous environmentalist. Jane Goodall, who again probably needs no introduction, but the woman whose work with chimpanzees has really changed the way that we regard human beings as well. Next. Now, some of them are not famous, <clears throat> and I want to step through a few of those, too, because these are people who we think should be famous, but uh, aren't yet. Betty Croswick is a great-grandmother who must now be about 87. I'm not sure. She was 82 or 3 when we interviewed her. She has spent two and a half years in her 80s in prison in British Columbia for obstructing uh, logging in old-growth forests and refusing to apologize and refusing to give an undertaking to the courts that she would not do it again. They said, if you persist in this folly, you're going to jail. She said, fine, and went to jail and did some very effective organizing in jail and came out with some really penetrating things to say about the prison system and how it works. Uh, so Betty Croswick, next. Um, Edmund Matachewaban is an elder in the Cree community of Peterbeck on, on James Bay. He's a residential school survivor, but he's also, uh, up until the age of eight, he lived in the traditional Cree lifestyle. And so he remembers what it was like to live in a way of life that had been sustainable for 11,000 years. Most of us have no concept of what it would be like to live in a really sustainable setting. Edmund does, and he's de dedicated himself now to preserving what he knows of that and sharing it, particularly with his own people, but to also to a large extent with the rest of us. He's an author, recently put up, uh, recently published a book called Up Ghost River, um, and a, a wonderful guy. Two days with Edmund changed my life, really. Next. Uh, Mark Boyle, a young Irish economist, who realized at a certain point that money intruded between him and his impact on the world. So he goes out and he buys coffee. And he doesn't have to face the fact that the, that the coffee may come from, from an unsustainable plantation and be harvested by people who are a little better than slaves. And the implications of his actions are masked by the fact that money stands between him and the, and the implications of what he does. So he decided to see if he could live for a year without money. And he did successfully live for a year without money and wrote a book called The Moneyless Man, which I commend to you. Um, at the end of the year, he was so happy and so healthy and uh, so content with his life that he simply carried on that way and began uh, a movement which he calls Free Economy, which the last time I checked was in, had 50,000 members in 168 countries. And Mark was still, after five or six years, he'd found a moneyless woman and gotten married and was living, <laughs> was continuing to live a money, actually moneyless people are not that hard to find, but, um, but he'd found one that didn't mind this way of life and uh, was going on very happily. I don't I think he has ever gone back to using money, but I'm not sure. I haven't checked for a couple of years. Um, okay, next. Santiago Manuel Valera is an Awahoon from the Amazonian rainforest in Peru, who was part of the protests of the First Nations in, in Peru against the licensing of the rainforest for exploration for oil um, and I, in, I think, 2005. 
Um, that led to a blockade of the main east-west highway in Peru. Finally, the police, the, the police had been there for some time. Finally, the government called in the army. There was a bloody confrontation known as the Bagua Massacre. Uh, 32 police died, 43 First Nations died. Santiago uh, was shot eight times and did survive. We interviewed him in, in Lima. But he's a really interesting illustration of a theme that becomes tremendously important, and that's the, the, the commitment of it isn't even the commitment of Aboriginal people to the world that they live in. It's the fact that they see themselves as part of it, as inseparable, and they see an assault on the, on the world around them as an assault on themselves. So for them, it's an existential um, uh, confrontation. And, and obviously, uh, Santiago and many others are really willing to die about that. That tells us, I think, something about what their understanding of the world is and what our understanding of the world is, and I think they are much wiser, and in cases like Santiago, clearly much braver than most of us would be. Uh, next, Hugo Spowers is a racing car driver from England, and loves cars, and was appalled at the impact of, of the automobile on the, on the environment, and set it out as his mission to eliminate the footprint of automobiles on the, on the environment. So he set out not only to reinvent the automobile, which he did, but also to reinvent the automobile industry. And the automobiles he produces are little town cars, uh, two-seaters, made of carbon fiber with completely recyclable components. Uh, he won't sell them. He will rent them to you, and you can lease them for about 300 bucks a month, including insurance. They're fueled by hydrogen. They have no emissions whatsoever. They get the equivalent of about 300 miles to the gallon. And if at the end of your three-year lease you want to keep the car, he will reduce the lease payment. If you want a new one, he will take the old one back. And when he takes the old one back, every single component gets recycled, even the body. The body he'll melt down and do another carbon fiber body um, out of the old body. He thinks that cars should be built where people use them, so he, his uh, uh, innovations are all open source. You can find them on the web if you want to build cars in Sydney, River Simple Cars in Sydney. He'll give, re give you every assistance that he can. He's rolling out now the cars are now for sale in Wales, and he's doing it by putting uh, hydrogen gas stations, in effect, hydrogen filling station, and then selling cars to within a 30 mile radius of the filling station. When that market is saturated, another filling station that overlaps, like a Venn diagram, and so on. That's the way he proposes to roll it out. It sounds pie in the sky. It seems to be working. Some of his backers have the last name Porsche, so I have some confidence in their, in their possibilities. Um, next. So by 2010, we had uh, done a whole bunch of interviews. These are some of the people that we had interviewed, some of whom you've, you've already met. And we were, like many other people, kind of confused about how to deal, what, we should, what our actions should be at this point, because there are so many different issues, you know, biodiversity, pollution of the oceans, pollution of the air, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So where should one person put their energies, and what, how could we make the biggest impact? And at that point, um, we met, next slide, David Boyd. <clears throat> now, David is a legal scholar from British Columbia who literally wrote the book uh, on, on environmental rights. He wrote a book called The Environmental Rights Revolution, which traces the spread of environmental rights from their first adumbration in Stockholm in 1972 uh, through to 2012 when we talked to him. And at that point, of the 193 nations in the UN, over 180 had recognized the legal rights of their own citizens to fresh air, clean water, and healthy food in their legal systems. People had a legal right to that, and in over 100 countries, it was a constitutional right. It was right in the foundation of the legal system. Among the, the countries that did not have, um, that had not recognized the legal rights to a healthy environment of their citizens, were such leading nations as uh, um, Oman, uh, North Korea, and Canada. And so we suddenly, this is when the light went on for us, we said, this is the place where if we had it, if we had the legal right to a healthy environment, any citizen could sue a corporation or a government for failing to protect and or for damaging their, their environmental rights. So this is a tool that could apply to any of the specific issues. And we thought this is where we should put our own little efforts to see if we could get that. If we could really get that in Canada. Uh, it would make a vast difference, as it does uh, in other countries. So that led to the Green Rights Project, and, uh, and to, uh, which now we finished in 2016. It includes 30 interviews with legal rights activists uh, uh, from 11 countries. Many of those are lawyers. Those are the people that are in the book, warrior lawyers. Um, many of them are not. Many of them are citizens who you know, led the fight in their own places uh, for, for, uh, to enforce their own rights under the legal system. Three films, an 11-minute film that David Suzuki uses to, for training purposes. 
a 45-minute film that was aired in, in 2015 on the CBC and the Maritimes. It's called uh, Defenders of the Dawn, subtitled Green Rights in the Maritimes. It's available online. Um, the 67-minute feature documentary that we'll be showing this evening in the Verschuren. And uh, Warrior Lawyers, the book that you've already seen. There are a number of uh, articles and presentations. And I'm delighted to say that there's a possibility of a university course being developed out of this, with, particularly on, on the application of the law and the use of the lawyers. There are huge implications that come out of this, though, for our view of the law. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, next. This is Thomas Lindsay and Mary Margill of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund in the States. And they uh, are, are uh, a really innovative uh, legal firm. And basically what they explained to us was that the legal systems are designed to foster commerce and industry. And the senior governments have the right to override legislation by the junior governments. So if the province, say, passes a piece of legislation that intrudes on the rights of corporations to, to prosper and profit, um, the federal governments generally have the right to override that. If it's a municipal uh, piece of legislation, the, the provincial or state government has a right to override that. And, and the point that they made was that really what we should have is the rights of the community, the rights of the citizens. And, and so if you wanted to say, no, we're not going to have a factory farm in our village, no, we're not going to have an oil refinery on our harbor, or whatever the, the issue may be, you should be able to enforce that. But the fact that you can't means, as they say, that the legal system as it now stands makes both democracy and sustainability illegal. Um, so that's a reframing that we needed to, to look at. And for, so for communities to reshape, to shape their futures, they re we really have to change the foundations of the legal system. So let's go back to the beginning. Next slide. This is the Great Dismal Swamp Canal. And the little boat on the left, the, the sailboat, with, uh, is the is the hero of a book over there called Sailing Away from Winter. My wife and I were in this canal, and uh, that's when this, this photograph was taken. But the interesting thing about the canal, and there's a lot of interesting things about the canal, it connects Virginia with North Carolina. And it was dug by a corporation, one of the first American corporations. And in those days, corporations were formed for specific purposes and dissolved when those purposes had been achieved. And this corporation was founded specifically to dig that canal. Now, there's lots of nasty stuff about that, because you can imagine it was dug by hand, and it wasn't a whole bunch of people like Thomas Jefferson wielding the shovels, I'll tell you. Um, but one of the shareholders, and one of the leaders of this, was George Washington. So when we were heading down south, my, my wife and I in the sailboat, we decided we absolutely had to go through this historic uh, uh, canal. However, um, at that point, as I said, you dissolved the corporation. The corporation existed to perform a particular function. When the function was over, it dissolved. Today, the corporations are immortal. They never dissolve, and they actually outrank us in terms of their legal rights. And the impact on the environment is just horrible. Next slide. So this is, what, this is the, the story of waste in the United States. Um, of the materials and energy that we take from the earth, 93% is wasted before the products are created. 7% become useful products. Of that 7%, 80% are discarded after a single use. And six months after the point of purchase, 99% of it is in the dump. When you look at, the, at that diagram, what this says to me is that the, what we call the economy has, is actually an extraordinarily effective and efficient system for turning the planet into garbage. That's really the outcome of the, and it's all going to be garbage, pretty much everything that we, that we create. But we don't even think about some of this stuff. I mean, one of the things that amazes me is, is, is the plastic garbage bag. This is a product that's created you know, with a very elaborate process, distributed through the whole economic distribution system. Its sole purpose is to be thrown away and to create a permanent problem. That's all it's for. You put the garbage in at once, you take it to the dump, and there it sits for hundreds of years. Or it goes out into the ocean, and there it stays for hundreds of years, too. That's another whole story that we will skip today. Anyway, I wanted to talk about a couple of places where you see the, the, the sort of the idiocy of the way we structure our thinking about economics. And this is one of them that we should be very familiar with here. Back in the 1990s, it was obvious to the inshore fishermen and to many fisheries scientists that the codfish were in real trouble. And so there was a call for, for the government to place a moratorium on codfishing and to give the cod stocks a chance to recover. 
The response from government, not just from industry, but the response <coughs> from government is typified by John Crosby, who said, and was then the fisheries minister, and said, we can't possibly do that. The economic implications would be terrible. We would lose all kinds of jobs. Co companies would have to close down plants. Companies would lose profits. It, it's just unthinkable to close down the fishery. So we kept on fishing for a couple more years, and then God closed down the fishery, um, because there just weren't enough fish left to, to, uh, to fish them in any... Uh, responsible way, even not, not even in any irresponsible way. So, 10-year moratorium, and it was supposed to be um, that the cod were going to recover in 10 years. We're now at 25, and they haven't recovered. Some have recovered a little bit, but not very much. This is the... Uh, Ronald Wright, who's one of our interviewees, talks about progress traps, and he, this is a classic case of it where you start out and you say, we're getting more and more efficient at fishing, right? We're building bigger boats and more efficient gear and so on and so forth, and we're getting bigger catches and everybody's getting wealthier. And that goes on right until the moment of collapse. And then suddenly it's all gone. And the result of it for this part of the country, I mean, I don't think we have ever really faced up to what this actually meant. 40,000 jobs lost, 40,000 jobs lost, and whole communities collapsing and closing and moving out, particularly in Newfoundland, but not only in Newfoundland. Glace Bay has gone from 29,000 to, I think, 16,000 people over roughly this period of time. And Glace Bay was, among other things, a fishing port. Um, so we're living with those consequences. And that's, that kind of stupidity just boggles my mind. Next, please. Oil is another one of these absolute idiocies. I don't know why we are rushing to get it out of the ground and burn it. It's irreplaceable. It's, uh, it's a magical material. It'll, do, it'll make all kinds of things. Look around you. This room is full of everything from the tree, the alleged tree, probably, uh, <laughs> you know, on through the ceiling, the carpets, the clothes we're wearing. This all comes from oil, and there's only so much. And we've gone through all the easy stuff in, in uh, less than a century. Uh, what are we leaving for our grandchildren, and why are we doing that? And what is really the value of a barrel of oil? I mean, if we leave it to the market to, to determine, the market says 50 bucks or thereabouts. But this is the way that people who think seriously about this have really come up with. It really equals the amount of energy that you would have to... Ex the amount of human energy that it replaces. David Hughes, one of our interviewees, says that if you put a guy on a treadmill and got him to walk until he had created, through an electrical generator, the amount of energy that's contained in a barrel of oil. How long would he walk? 8.6 years, right? That's what a barrel is really worth. That's what a barrel of oil is really worth. And if we began to... If we evaluated it at a tenth of that, at, you know, um, <clears throat> at one hundredth of that, we would not use it for garbage bags, right? If we really had any comprehension of what we're doing and of how we are squandering a heritage that's completely irreplaceable, we would not do it in that way. Um, okay, so um, I want to quote Kenneth DeFaze, a great geologist, petroleum geologist, and he said, puts, puts this absolutely precisely. Fossil fuels are a one-time gift that lifted us up from subsistence agriculture and eventually should lead us to a future based on renewable resources. That's what it is. That's, it's a one-time gift. It's a bridge between human labor for everything and, and sustainable energy on the other end. And we are just going through it at such a ridiculous pace. To see the real obscenity of this, we'll look at the next slide. It wouldn't matter if the substance was liquid plutonium destined for a child's breakfast cereal. If the government bans a product and a US-based product uh, company loses profits, the company can claim damages under NAFTA. This, to me, is absolutely the reductio ad absurdum of corporate dominance. The quote is absolutely obscene. Profits outweigh everything, health, environment, even the future of the planet, and the survival of life itself, including our own lives. That's ult that is the, the most honest statement about what we've, the kind of society we've created and the role of corporations in it that I've ever seen. Um, so, what do we do? Well, Knowing that we are caught in a kind of pathological paradigm of commerce and law, environmental rights represent a fundamental shift in perspective and potentially in power. And so that was the purpose of the Green Rights Project, was to tell some stories about the power of such rights and how they are used in the countries where they are, are recognized. Next. This is Tony Aposa. Tony is one of my favorite people in the world. He's a lawyer in the Philippines, and he likes to walk in the, in the mountains. And he went up walking in the mountains one day in the forest, and the forest was gone. It had been clear-cut. 
And Tony looked into the question of what they were doing with the forests in the Philippines, and he discovered that they were cutting them down at such a rate that there would be no old growth forests left in about eight years after the, the time that his own forest was cut down. So he said, this means that we are leaving no old growth forests for, for our successors. Um, this is a tremendously irresponsible way to treat the, the, you know, the legacy of future generations. And so we went to court and he sued on behalf of future generations. He said, on behalf of the children who will inherit the, the Philippines, um, I want to, I'm, I'm suing to make the government quit uh, issuing permits for logging in old growth forests, period. And the, the, the first court um, rejected this, uh, this as preposterous because, of course, you know, people who don't yet exist don't have legal personality. How can they sue? They aren't there. Um, that uh, didn't deter Tony. Tony regards the, uh, the, the, the legal suits as a story. It's, the courts as a way of telling stories. He says, if you tell your story in court, people have to listen, including the people that you want to listen. Evidence comes forward, the story, you know, thing is, it's logical, it, it comes to some kind of a conclusion, and if you lose, then you appeal, and now you get to tell the story again. So he did. And over, I think it was 10 years or thereabouts, finally it got to the Supreme Court of the Philippines, which ruled in his favor. And there is now no logging in the old growth forests of the Philippines. But more important yet, they recognize the principle that the current generation has an obligation to future generations. That's become known as the principle of, uh, of intergenerational equity, of our obligation to treat our successors fairly. And it's used in, in courts all over the world where it's known as the Opposa Doctrine, after one courageous little Filipino lawyer acting on his own and using his own money. <clears throat> People sometimes say, what can one person do? What can one person do? I would like to do a book just on Tony Aposa because he's not, he's not only done that, he's done a whole bunch of wonderful things. I mean, for example, he does enforcement as well as prosecution. So he, he goes out and he gets the poachers who have been re-fishing with dynamite and cyanide and that sort of thing, collars them with the police, brings them to court, and then he's, what he's, and then he, this is, this is the, this is the activity that he's proudest of. He says, I get them into my adversaries to allies program. I am so hard against them in court, he said, I am prosecuting them to the full majesty of the law. But as soon as I see that I'm going to win, I ask the court if I could have a little time with the accused. And then I take the accused and he said, I want to make you an offer that you can't refuse. Um, he said, here's what's happening. You're going to court. You'll probably be gone for 10 years. When you come back, your wife will have another husband. Your children will be gone. The water will have closed over the place that you once lived in. Um, now, you can do that if you want to plead not guilty, and I will prosecute you as vigorously as I can. But if you agree to go back to court and plead guilty now, I will ask the court to discharge you into my custody for five years. And then I will take you out and I will make you a steward. I will make you... Um, uh, an enforcement officer against the very th crimes that you committed in the first place. And of course, they, who can refuse, right? And, and so they, he's had a number of people do this. And he said, they are the most wonderful enforcement officers because they know everything about the business. They know who the villains are. They know where they live. They know where they do their banking. They know all the techniques that they use to, to evade suspicion. And he said, and generally, they didn't want to, these, these guys didn't want to I want to do the crimes that they've done, they're very happy to have an opportunity to regain their self-respect and redeem themselves. And Tony says, redemption is what this life is all about. And if I can offer redemption to somebody, that makes me prouder than any other, any other thing. This is Daniel Salaberry in Rio de Janeiro. And Daniel was, was uh, frustrated at the fact that the Constitution of Argentina did recognize the environmental rights of the citizens, but that wasn't being respected in practice. And so he got together with 70 residents of an impoverished Riverside community, and, uh, and they brought a suit against 44 corporations, three levels of government, and I think 14 municipalities for having infringed the, the residents' right to a healthy environment. And again, it took many years, but they won. And when they won, the court gave a, what uh, was known as a sweeping and poetic uh, judgment, as one observer said, and basically set up a whole structure of... Um, of <clears throat> an intergovernmental agency specifically charged with the cleanup of the Rio Chuelo River, obliged to report back to the courts on their progress, and, and, uh, and, uh, and subject to penalties if they failed to do it. So the net result was, in one year, they spent a billion dollars on a 50-mile river, and they have on that river now 250 environmental inspectors, which is more than we have 
in all of Canada, right, on that one river. Um, and the river is by no means pristine. It had been polluted since the Spaniards came and established tanneries on it in the 16th century, but it is a way cleaner than it ever was, and the, dog, the dead horses and the, and the abandoned ships and all the stuff that was in there at the beginning, all the big stuff has been cleaned up and the riverbank slums have been cleared to a large extent as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the Netherlands. Uh, Roger Cox is a lawyer in Ma Maastricht. He's uh, just a single lawyer in private practice. Uh, he's in a firm, but he's a private, you know, he's, a, he's not a, an official of any kind. And he saw the, um, um, he saw the film, um, oh, the, An Inconvenient Truth, and was so horrified by what he saw, by what he saw, that he got the rights to, he and his partners got the rights to show the film in the Netherlands, and they did it for, for nothing um, around the whole country. And he finally concluded that there was really, that, uh, that the, the putting pressure on government simply wasn't going to work. And the specific issue that he wanted to tackle was that all the government, the leading industrial countries at Cancun in, I think, 2008, agreed that by 2020, we should achieve reductions in carbon emissions of between 25 and 40 percent. The government of the Netherlands wasn't going to get anywhere near that. And, and, uh, and they were sort of saying, well, our contribution to the emissions is really not very great. So it really doesn't matter. And Daniel's saying, no, it does matter. Whatever your share is, that's your share. Um, so went to court. And to, get the, to ask the courts to force the government to respect its own commitment to, to get those emissions down. And won. Um, it is, uh, do we have Marianne? No. Um, wrote a book called Revolution Justified, Why Only the Law Can Save Us Now. But his whole point about this was the court, if you go to court, the courts attend to evidence. They don't pay attention to pressure. They don't pay attention to um, the next election. They, you know, they, they, uh, they basically, they hear the evidence and they make their decision. And that's why he thought it was worthwhile to go to court in the first place. And of course, the outcome establishes that that is so. Next slide, please. This is Alberto Acosta, who was the Minister of Energy in Ecuador. Um, and who also was the president of the commission that in 2008 established a new constitution for Ecuador, known as the Monte Cristi Constitution. And that constitution was the first constitution on earth to recognize the rights not only of human beings, but of Mother Nature herself. And so you have now a constitution in Ecuador where a river can sue. And people will have to do work on behalf of the river, but if, you're, if you take on the job of being the steward of a river or a forest or a lake or whatever it is, you can go to court and you have standing to sue. And, and this is a radical new view of the law. And what he, what, what, when you talk to uh, Alberto, which we did, uh, he says that what he's trying to build is an economy of life to replace the economy of death. And economy de, economia della muerte, he says. And I thought, yeah, this is, uh, this is wonderful. Here's another, uh, if we can go on here. This is another uh, thinker in the same field. This is uh, Cormac Cullinan from South Africa. He's the author of a book called Wild Law. And both he and, and Acosta and Pablo Salon of uh, Bolivia and others were part of the team that created the, um, the Declaration of the Rights of, of Pachamama, of Mother Earth. Uh, which was released in Bolivia in 2010, and basically asserts that the earth itself has rights and that our, that we are, our rights are subservient to that. Cormac's view is, is our cultural understandings shape the way that we view the law. And if we understood more clearly where we really stand in the world, we would develop a legal system that would, uh, as he says, would contribute to our participation in a positive way in the overall development of the entire living fabric of, of, uh, of, of the planet. Um, so wrote a book to try and say what that kind of a legal system might look like um, and has some very eloquent things to say about it. So if we start to think about new forms of law, next please. Um, this is John Burroughs, who's a Canadian scholar, teaches at the University of Victoria. If I were 20 years old, I would go back to school and I would go to Victoria to study with John Burroughs, one of the most um, brilliant and, and uh, humane uh, men I've ever met. But he makes the point that, uh, that, that Canada's environment is unusually rich in that we have three systems of law. We have British common law. We have French civil law, but because of the 1982 Constitution and the way that it recognized the participation of the indigenous people in the, in the, in the country, uh, we also have recognized the legal systems, the legal traditions of the First Nations, of all the First Nations right across the country. Um, and when I talked to him about this, I said, okay, 
if we've got common law, civil law, and indigenous law, what's in common? What's law? Right? Uh, what makes a law a law? And he said a law is, is where you look to find your guidance for your behavior. Um, it's where you're, it's the source of authority, and, and, and drew an example that, I, that has haunted me ever since. He said, if in the, in the British civil law, or common law tradition, authority derives from the crown, and ownership derives from the crown, so the whole, the, you know, the land is all, uh, have, has all been the crown land in the first place, some of it still is, the phrase is familiar, right? Um, and then it's been conveyed to individuals and organizations and so forth, but the source of authority there is the crown. It starts with the crown. In the Aboriginal traditions, and they're, not, they're, they're quite different in many respects, but on this point I think they're mostly in, in harmony. In the Aboriginal tradition, the world comes to us as a gift from the Creator, and it is therefore sacred. And the place you look for guidance is to the natural world. So John will say, it says things like, he says, you know, for example, if you're asking yourself, how should a parent behave, maybe you learn that by watching birds. You watch how they feed their young, how they care for their young, how they keep them in a nest and keep them safe, and then at a certain point when they're ready, they push them out. And maybe that's the way that you learn about how parents should behave and how bad parents, bad parents are parents who are not behaving in accordance with that kind of thing. But ultimately, for John, the, your understanding of law is a spiritual matter. It depends on the way you see the world. It depends on the way you understand your own position in the world. Uh, it rests on your, on your vision of reality. Next slide, please. Now, this is a confrontation between that view of the world and the industrial view of the world in, in uh, New Brunswick in 2013. And I think this is a terrifically uh, inspiring story because it shows the power of, of what happens when we get to when we act together. This was a, a, a protest not only by First Nations, but also by English-speaking and French-speaking settlers, all coming together to say, no, you will not frack in New Brunswick. And the power of that alliance, the First Nations have rights that, the, that uh, settlers don't have, that derive from the treaties. So there are things that they can do that the rest of us can't do. But there also is the fact that they have been so spurned and scorned over the years that it's easy to, to kind of, uh, it has been easy to dismiss them. But if they have settlers with them, um, these are people who's, who are, um, you know, have had the, the benefit of the arrangements we've had in this country. Um, and the two, the two, the two um, traditions here really are in a life and death struggle. I mean, the, the, the government, the police, the army, um, all of that was lined up on behalf of the corporation that wanted to do fracking in New Brunswick. And the alliance against them was consisted of French, English, and, and uh, Mi'kmaq and ultimately lots of others from across the country, um, and they won. They won. They, they uh, actually defeated the, the fracking proposal. They forced the government, the corporation to leave, and they defeated the government in the next election, and, and now there is a moratorium on uh, fracking in New Brunswick. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. This is Larry Kowalchuk. Because at the end of the Elsa Buktuk confrontation, these, uh, the participants wanted to ensure that they would be able to keep the gains that they had made, and wanted to enshrine them in law. And Larry is a, a, a rights lawyer from Saskatchewan, and he organized with them two lawsuits. One of them is the lawsuit that calls for a permanent moratorium on fracking. That one is not going forward at this point because they have a moratorium. Um, but the other one maintains that the, that the very act of authorizing fracking in New Brunswick was illegal because it contravenes the treaties. And uh, it contravenes also the right the, of uh, people to free speech. The behavior of the government does that too. If these two lawsuits succeed, they will probably confer legal rights to a healthy environment on all of us. Because what they are based on is the idea that the Constitution includes the right of human beings and citizens to life, liberty, and security of the person. And if the security of the person doesn't mean you have a right to breathe and a right to eat decent food and a right to drink healthy water, uh, what does it mean? So we may find that, the, that Canada's um, uh, approach to green rights will be through those lawsuits. There is, uh, and I should, <clears throat> there has also been a long pressure, particularly from the Suzuki Foundation, but also from people like us, um, across the country in favor of getting environmental rights in the Canadian legal system. And I'm happy to say that last June, the, the Standing Committee of the House of Commons on Sustainability and Climate Change 
brought down its report on the revisions they th thought should be included in the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, uh, which is due for revision this year. And one of the things that they said was the revision of that act should recognize the, the rights of, of Canadian citizens to clean water, clean air, and healthy food. So it may be that at least the issue is on the table now. The issue is in, is, is in play in Ottawa. And it may be that we will actually wind up with those rights in the, next, um, in the next parliament. I wanted to mention just basically the film and the book. And the Green Rights film was what that's about is about going around the world and finding these stories. And there are many others. Um, we didn't get them all in the film. There are even many others in the film beyond what I've mentioned here. Um, but basically to show Canadians and uh, what environmental rights mean and what it is that we don't have and uh, hopefully to generate some pressure towards them, and I think it has probably succeeded in that way. And, um, and Warrior Lawyers, the book that we've already mentioned, is in-depth lawyers with, not with all the people in these cases, but with the lawyers specifically who've taken these cases forward. And I want to conclude with a wonderful comment from the great environmentalist Paul Hawken. Hawken says in the present situation, he said, if, you, if you're not a pessimist, you haven't read the science. If you're not a pessimist, you haven't read the science. If you're not an optimist, you haven't met the people. We've met the people, and we are tremendously grateful for the opportunity to do that, and I am tremendously grateful for the opportunity to bring that here back to CBU, back to my sort of home university. Thank you very much. Merci bien. Voilà, Léa.